Welcome to the Assyrian Global Network. My name is Carmen Morad. On the Modern Assyrian program today, I am very excited to introduce three very dynamic researchers and um, advocates of genocide studies. And I would like to begin by introducing Professor John Lefferton of Arizona State University, Kathy Sayad Zatari, a uh, genocide activist with SAFO Center, and of course, Dr. Ramina Jeju. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for having me. Be here. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be on this program to talk about something that is very dear to not just the Assyrian community, but to all communities who care about humanity, who care about learning from atrocities from the past, and as we will talk about what is happening today in the world. Let me begin by introducing Kathy Sayad Zatari, who is a relentless advocate of genocide studies and particularly Assyrian genocide. Welcome to the program, Kathy. Thank you. Um, we spoke uh, many times on this program, Kathy, on what you are working on and what SAFO Center has been working on. Please tell us about what is happening uh, in your state on April 4th, 2022. As I understand this, and the more, more of the details will come from Romina and the professor this evening, but there... Uh, is a week-long uh, genocide awareness program in which among the various topics will be the Assyrian genocide. And I know that Ramina is working tirelessly to put on a local exhibit. And the way I am helping her is providing information about what we are currently doing there in your neighborhood at Cal State Stanislaus to provide tips, suggestions, examples of items that might be posted in an exhibit, oral histories, the types of things that really make the, the genocide story come alive and, and feel real to those who would uh, visit the exhibit and would participate. And that week is when in Arizona, uh, these, uh, this program will start. Fantastic. You know, uh, Kathy, locally in the Turlock Journal, there was an article uh, based on what you just told me. So uh, there is uh, anticipation on that. But let's go to Professor John uh, Lefferton. Please share with us. First of all, welcome to the program. It is our first time. We're honored to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, had the opportunity to work with Romina now for about four years. COVID, of course, has messed that up a, a bit where we had some live things planned, but we did virtual things mm -hmm. nonetheless. So um, I'm the founder of Genocide Awareness Week. It started, uh, this was going to be the 10th anniversary in April. Um, the week uh, of the conference is, starts April 4th and it ends April 8th. It's all uh, at Arizona State University, which has uh, really stepped up um, because I, it was originally at Scottsdale Community College. And then when I retired there last year and became a consultant to ASU, I uh, was working with wonderful people like Dr. Walker Pinkert and Hava Samuelson and Tim Longio. I was able to bring it over and they opened it up and we have expanded it to where we're going to have something that's even larger than we've ever had before with um, uh, presentations starting at nine in the morning and going till eight o'clock at night. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big conference. It's the largest uh, in North America. And that's uh, that came from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They were the ones who, who said that we are doing uh, amazing things. It's going to get even larger now because we're partnering with um, Northern Arizona University, the Martin Springer Institute and University of Arizona. So you've got the three big universities here, which will be about a quarter of a million students there that will be able to attend this along with faculty and the, and the community. It's open and free to the public. Um, everything is absolutely 100% free. And the type of presenters that we have cover all types of genocides, 
um, historical and current. And we have academics, we have activists, we have politicians, we have law enforcement, we have um, authors. Uh, we've had also in the past even film directors who have made documentaries about certain films. So it's a it has something that will reach out to students of all different types of backgrounds, those who are interested in filmmaking, for example, or those who are interested in history or such. Uh, and of course, uh, political science and human rights. Um, and that's where working with Romina has been very good because not only do we do what one would consider the Holocaust, for example, or the Holodomor, uh, which, is, which are the Ukrainians that were murdered by Stalin, but we're talking about the Armenians and the Assyrians and the Greeks who were murdered mm -hmm. by the Turks, who are still, many Turks are still actively denying that, uh, that genocide, which carries on that genocide. So it's important, in fact, it's imperative now in light of what's happening in Turkey today and what's happening in uh, the Middle East, the politics there, but uh, and such, it's imperative that people know about prior genocides and how they, they came to be, as it were, um, and apply that knowledge to hopefully mitigating or stopping genocides happening elsewhere. Um, you know, everybody says never again and, you know, never forget and never again, but it keeps happening. All we got to do is look at the People's Republic of China and what they're doing to the Uyghurs with concentration camps and murdering and, and using rape as a, as a weapon and such. These are, are things that must be stopped if we can do that. But the only way to get that done is to educate people about that. Um, and, and now I'm very worried because on the horizon is Bosnia again, um, because the, the situation there in 95, when the Dayton Accord transpired, uh, it stopped things happening, but it, you know, things don't look good there either. So we could be right back to where we were, you know, 25 years ago. Thank you, John. That gives us, uh, an, a perspective uh, when it comes to genocide and what this um, Genocide Awareness Week will be about. But you mentioned historical <clears throat> genocide and then there is ongoing. So other than historical and awareness, uh, how much of accountability will be discussed? Because when we talk about what is going on, there is, of course, uh, humanitarian activists who are observing but where is the accountability and is there any when it comes to genocide well the accountability um has been we have seen how for example uh germany has embraced their guilt and said yes we are guilty what we did to the jews and the the roma and the Sinta and the other groups of people uh, was wrong. That was a, a um, genocide. But there are other people who, who deny that. And so we try to, to, to bring in people who will state that the Turks, for example, who are denying what they did in Armenia and Assyria and, and to the Greeks um, mm -hmm. in the 19th and early 20th centuries, they, they are still denying that. And so we bring that information out and present it to, to the community and to students and with the facts uh, that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that what uh, Erdogan and other people are saying is absolutely, those are lies. And they can't be, they're perpetuating a type of genocide by denying that. And, and, and I don't wanna say all Turks believe that, they don't. You can take um, uh, Tanner Akjem from Clark University, who's a very well-known, Turkish scholar and academic who has read the old um, Arabic, Turkish Arabic, where you have the orders sending people out to kill the Armenians and Assyrians and such, and you have the after action reports. And he has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that um, this information is still out there. It's still available to scholars to be published and he's published it. And so 
that is what we bring to the conference. He spoke a, a few years ago, and I think he's going to be coming. We're, we're looking at planning another uh, panel with him uh, mm -hmm. in 2023 for the 11th one. And uh, Romina and, uh, is working with me and some others to try to bring in a panel of an Armer Armenian, a Syrian, and a Greek with Tanner Akjum being the moderator of that panel. That is amazing because, you know, when you have such a diverse panel and working with uh, our Armenian brothers and sisters and working with the Greek community and other communities such as the Hmong or the Sikh, and uh, as we know, the list goes on. But uh, Kathy mentioned earlier that we had been doing um, these genocide remembrance days at CSU Stanislaus in uh, Turlock where there is a large Assyrian community. And John, I have to tell you, when we first had our first on-campus Genocide Awareness Day, and it was in English, and we had uh, guest speakers that came and spoke, and Sabri Atman was our first guest speaker. And we invited members of the community that they literally told us this was their first time hearing about the Assyrian genocide. They didn't know. So every step of advocacy at every level, whether it's a city, county, state, or on campuses through a scholarly um, event such as you are planning, this is such important work. And I would like to thank each and every one of you, especially you, Professor Lifetin, for the, the passion that you have to pursue this. And as I ask every scholar that I have interviewed, I would like to ask you about that aha moment that you had that really touched you, that you decided this is what you wanted to do. This is what you wanted to pursue. Can you share a glimpse of that to our viewers so we have more of a humanized uh, version of why we do what we do to advocate to be the voice for the voiceless? My aha moment was when I happened to be working in Macedonia for uh, for a program that, that we were in, working with the uh, American Association of Community Colleges. So on the way back from working there, I stopped off in Prague and I went to Theresienstadt or Terezin, uh, which was a ghetto and a concentration camp. Um, Terezin uh, is, is very famous because the Nazis used it as a show camp for the intelligentsia of Europe, but they also made a, um, they, they were able to manipulate a Jewish director to come in and make a film uh, about how well the, the, uh, the Jews were being treated by the Nazis. And they told him, when, when you do this, we'll, you know, we'll let you go, you and your family go. Within an hour after the film was, was finished, he was sent to uh, Auschwitz and killed. Um, but the film worked. It actually was shown to the Red Cross. They came out with a report that uh, that was fairly exonerating for the for the, um, the the Germans, saying that that you know they're treating the Jews well and such. Um, to cut a long story short, on the way I went over, I walked the 15, 20 minute walk to the um, the prison concentration camp. And um, it was a snowy, cold day, and there was nobody around. And it, so that was a very emotive situation for me because here I am seeing rooms with the beds in them, uh, seeing pr prison cells. And on the way out, I, I ended up in a field where at one end of the field, there was a uh, three posts where they executed people. And uh, uh, behind the three posts was a, a dike and a red brick wall. When I walked out, which was also past the gallows and turned left, I noticed just on the other side of the red brick wall was a Olympic sized swimming pool. And across the street from that was a two story building with a balcony where the commandant at the, of the camp could look down and see his children playing in the pool. And that really struck me. That was an aha moment because I thought, oh my gosh, these people are going to be walking to their deaths in a, a few minutes, a minute prior to being shot or, or hung. 
or hanged, they were going to see children playing in this pool. And and that just, I, I couldn't understand that, how the, the inhumanity of that. At the same time, it hit me that here is this commandant and other SS officers and such who were in the area who were letting their children swim in this pool when literally um, five feet away, six feet away on the other side of that wall, people were being ex executed and being hanged. And the children would were were aware of this and it to me i just that was this aha moment where i was saying i don't understand that how can that happen how can people be that way and other people need to know about this too and so that started the ball rolling so when i was asked by the uh, holocaust memorial museum to actually do a workshop uh, with them i that started it and and that workshop was planned for one day. It was so successful. We had so many teachers show up and it was in the middle of the summer. Teachers are away, students are away. Mm -hmm. We had 130 teachers show up. And so I went to the president of the, of the college, Dr. Jan Gaylor, who said this, because uh, I suggested, let's take, take this and expand it. And and I thought, well, maybe we do a Thursday, Friday, half day, Saturday type thing. Well, in getting speakers and such, there was such a need by the different communities and the different, there was so much to be told that it filled up to a seven day conference. And that was uh, the first and of many, and here we are going on to, into our 10th anniversary conference now. And fortunately I'm working with people like Romina who is excellent for finding phenomenal speakers um, such as Sabri Atman, who you had on your show. And it, it's just a real pleasure to work with her and, and the Armenian church and the Bosnians mm -hmm. and other people. But Romina has been a fantastic partner to work with. Thank you, John. Yes, she is uh, amazing. And, and we do cherish all her efforts. Uh, John, thank you for sharing that very profound moment. Um, I, I really take that in because, you know, uh, the three of us that uh, on on this screen, we are descendants of genocide survivors. We are granddaughters, great granddaughters of genocide survivors, and we grow up with that transgenerational uh, trauma that is a part of the fabric of our identity. So when we have non-Assyrians or non-Armenians, non-Greeks um, share their stories of that pain and the commitment that we share in the humanity of being the voice for the voiceless is extremely profound. And I would like to thank each and every one of you for what you do because we come from countries where we don't have uh, the right to speak up on these matters. Being, you know, Christian minorities in in Muslim countries, for example, or where there is persecution or there is conflict. So, this work is so meaningful and important to me. And and moving on from that, um, I would like to uh, go back to uh, Kathy. Kathy, if you could remind our viewers of how you and I met and how it was to be that you became a speaker, one of, one of our speakers uh, at uh, California State University Stanislaus, where we did the Assyrian Genocide Remembrance on August 7th. Um, there is a program by Francis Sargis called the Modern Assyrian Heritage Project. Please share with us and as a summary, tell us what it is that brings you in this. And I know how passionate you are about that, Kathy. You sure you want to get me going this evening? <laughs> yes, and I do. Nonetheless? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm ready to play ball here. Uh, you and I met briefly at the Shara Festival. I got to know a lovely Assyrian man who had ancestors who came from the same village outside the Ermia region. And as you all know, and many of your listeners know, had a huge Assyrian population before 1915. 
And so generations of Assyrians who have resettled in many states have festivals that were actually celebrated by their churches, their villages, and so forth. And one of these is the Shara festival, which you hold there in Stanislaus County. Well, he wanted me to speak at the festival because of my knowledge of the genocide and what my grandmother, my paternal grandmother in particular, had gone through. And so uh, I gave um, a fairly blunt talk at that, um, at that occasion. But my point there was, and that was when I first met you, was for our community to think of ourselves not just as survivors, but, but winners, that we could have some victory as a people and we could accomplish and we could do anything in this country, in the West, that any other group of people could do. And that has been my family story. I believe Carmen is your family story. Romina, I know it's your family story. So what became important to me in advocacy was the understanding that we as, as descendants of survivors, we need to build in a method ourselves to, to transfer this knowledge that we have, that we got from our parents, we got from our grandparents, to our children, to coming along their children. Because we have to get past what the professor rightly noted as denial, and, and as you know, to the Turks to this day, um, ha have the entire denial just built into so many of their DNA almost. But we must get past that. And the second thing that drives me as, as an advocate is memory. And you talked about the difficulty to present a lot of this to young people. Well, what I have found is a way to get into young people, uh, and more specifically, our young people, the Syrian youth, is to show them. Show them things that we actually lived with. If it was a samovar that someone managed to take with them on the road from Urmia, Iran, and walk several hundred miles to Bakuba, Iraq. The clothing that Ramina's grandparents wore, that their grandmother made in the camp, in the Bakuba camp, and she managed to get it with her all the way out after they left the camp. Seeing those tangible items, I have the headscarf of a woman, it was a gift to me. She was uh, by herself, took three tiny kids under eight years old and walked that path to Bakuba. And she held onto that scarf for dear life and through a friend, I was privileged and honored to get that scarf. But to show the young people these items, and to show them, the actual people own these things. These are everyday items. The professor talks about the beds you see, the bedding, the pillows, whatever. These things are what I found make it human to younger people. Uh, I did go and speak at Cal State Stanislaus, and you were kind enough to make enlargements of my grandmother's property deeds, which I have the originals of. And those show specifically, they talk about members of the family, members of the family who were killed by the Turks, where they lived, what kind of house they had, what kind of land they had, the orchards, just you name it. They lived the same life, Carmen, that your grandparents lived, and Romina, your grandparents lived, and tens of thousands of other Assyrians that lived there at that time. And to show these everyday items to people, I have found this is what makes the connection with younger people. And I see, besides memory, as I say, to get past denial and to get to where you want to go, which is resilience, one more mm -hmm. piece, representation. And I have found that once memory is gone, history is gone. But once, if there is no representation, a people are gone. And our young people need this knowledge to represent us as we go forward, no matter where we are. We all know it, it, Assyrians are a diaspora community. All right, very few are in the Middle East and now. We are people of the West now, and we are going to be for some time. But if we are going to continue as we are as a people, then we need this body of information to our young people so that they may represent us in the way that they need to. And it's our obligation and responsibility to teach them. And that is really the main thing that drives me. And so I must thank you for letting me get on my soapbox this evening, Carmen. 
Um, you articulated so eloquently, Kathy, as you often do, which is um, breaking it down to what it is that we're doing. We are um, talking about memory. And as what Safo Center does is collection of the memories of very few survivors that are still alive. We, we surpass the 100, you know, the century uh, as it was a few years ago. So collecting that information, uh, the memories, the stories that I have from my grandparents that I recall. And how do we sustain that that, that compassion that we have through the young uh, generation. And it has to do through conferences and seminars like this. And um, I'd like to go uh, to Dr. Romina now. And I know, um, Romina, you and I have discussed several times about uh, the role that community plays when it comes to our advocacy and with you it's relentless advocacy that has to do with our elected officials when we ask for a proclamation a resolution um, it's an affirmation of what has happened it, an affirmation makes it uh, a legal document that didn't exist before and it is that way that every year whether it's in april whether it's in August, I know it, with the Greeks, it's, I believe, in May, we have October, regardless of when it is, that affirmation is so important to us. And I know you've done some amazing work with Arizona State Legislature. Please share with us what that means, taking the scholarly and historical conversation of genocide and making that transition to a political conversation, Romina. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be on this program again. And I want to take a moment to congratulate you as the presenter for the uh, uh, Modern Assyrian and all the uh, wonderful staff at Assyrian Global Network for this new venture. Uh, I've worked with your team in the past. Uh, they have uh, proven themselves to be really wonderful. Uh, and I'm certain that you will succeed um, in 2022 and the coming years. Um, it's also an honor for me to be here with uh, Professor Lifferton uh, and also Ms. Uh, Kathy Zatari. They're truly, truly um, amazing mentors for me, and it's been a pleasure to uh, work with them. Um, it, it, yes, it's true, SAFO Center, especially Arizona chapter, uh, has done some advocacy work. We were the first um, uh, group uh, or uh, organization uh, that in collaboration with the Assyrian American Cultural Organization of Arizona and the Assyrian Student Association uh, did a proclamation that recognized the uh, genocide of 1915 uh, and recognized uh, August 7th as the Assyrian uh, Genocide Remembrance Day or Assyrian Martyrs Day. Uh, that was uh, completed in um, March of 2020, just before COVID uh, took hold of Arizona. Um, but our motto and our mis mission and vision in SAFO Center is not just uh, uh, political advocacy. It's actually uh, to serve the community, uh, to educate and to advocate. And uh, part of uh, the reason we advocate because, uh, is because advocacy is a way of uh, also educating the, uh, uh, the legislators. Um, so that's a different platform that we use to educate our legislators and also like uh, just like you said it's a way of um allowing our people to have that uh cathartic moment uh, which is very important um for people who have been uh, subjected to genocide multiple times over the centuries uh to have that moment of acknowledgement um uh and uh, just like john said the denial is the final step in uh, uh in committing genocide and we're here to um, reverse that process uh, by educating and empowering the uh, the um, future generations. Uh, we're all in a in a uh, in a stage in our lives where um, we're focusing on people who are going to come after us, our mm -hmm. kids, our grandkids. This is very important for all of us. I'm sure I'm speaking for John and Kathy and uh, you. Um, 
uh, because what's happened to us is in the past, but we want to protect the future generations from uh, from these atrocities. And education is uh, uh, one way of doing it. And I also want to really thank Kathy. She's been an amazing mentor because we are going to have um, a small uh, photo exhibit at Arizona State University West Campus in Glendale, which if you have time, I can expand a little bit more on that. Uh, but mm -hmm. Kathy has been amazing in um, showing me resources and kind of directing me um, in the right direction as to what kind of items to display. It's mostly a photo uh, exhibit. Um, do we have time to talk about that? Absolutely. Feel free okay. to give us as much information. I want our viewers to know what to expect and how they can register and when, if they have the time and the interest to participate either personally or virtually. Great, great. Thank you. So um, John talked about Genocide Awareness Week, which has been going on for almost a decade now. Next year is going to be the 10 year anniversary. And we're delighted to be working with him uh, on this massive platform. Um, and we will have Sabri Atman as one of our guest speaker and also guest speakers and also Dr. Anahit Khosrayeva from Armenia uh, will be joining us. However, um, John uh, also uh, put me in touch with uh, Dr. Heather smith Kanoy, who is, if I, hopefully I'll get this right, she is the Associate Professor of Political Science and the Director of uh, Global Human Rights Hub um, at the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences at ASU, as well as Dr. Malay Faraz, who is the Assistant Professor. Uh, of anthropology at the same school. So um, they are going to be working with us um, at the ASU West Campus in Glendale uh, to hopefully put a um, photo exhibit together at the Flet at Fletcher Library. Uh, and this is going to be um, uh, the first photo exhibit that focuses on the genocide of 1915. Um, involving the Assyrians and the Armenians. Um, so far, we don't have Greek representation. We're working on that. It's been a little bit difficult, um, but we are um, making all efforts to also engage with the Greek community. Um, and hopefully this will take place at the same time um, uh, as the Genocide Awareness Week. However, the exhibit, the exhibit may actually go on for about a month. Um, and as um, many of us know, um, the Assyrian community uh, lives um, mostly in Glendale um, and uh, Peoria and North Phoenix. So about 60% of our population live along the Northern Loop of uh, Loop 101, Northern border of Loop 101, which is a mm -hmm. freeway that surrounds the city of Phoenix. Um, so 60% live there. And a lot of our kids actually go to the West Campus at ASU. Um, so I think they're going to be very happy to see um, to see their history displayed, mm -hmm. even though it's a dark history, um, but uh, it's important to them. Um, and uh, I, we also have um, a Syrian Student Association that are collaborating with us on this. Um, uh, we met with the librarian there. Uh, they're very, very enthusiastic, very excited. Uh, we've met with the Armenian community. So, um, so this is one of the new uh, ventures that we will have for April of 2022, and we are so excited. And the the outfit that Kathy was talking about, uh, my grandparents, I wanna say grandparents because I'm not sure whether my grandmother wore it or my grandfather, I really don't know, but my grandmother made it, um, is going to hopefully be also displayed uh, in a display box. So we'll see how it goes. It's exciting. This outfit is almost a century old uh, and hopefully, you know, my parents have kept it in a pretty good shape for a century. I hope that I can do the same uh, moving forward. So thank you, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Carmen. Wow, what a story. Can you imagine the stories that these items could speak and could tell? Uh, you know, I would like to touch back on what Kathy said. We often talk about why we concentrate so much on genocide and the past. It is so important to repeat this to whoever has this conversation that we have to learn from the past to make sure that atrocities and genocides in the past are not repeated, as John said earlier. We have to know what happened, but not all genocide is the actual murder and killing. 
there's different kinds of genocide that has to do with uh, eliminating a certain uh, way of life, eliminating the cultures and heritage. And uh, of course, genocide is the ultimate removal and uh, systemic killing. John, let me go back to what you said earlier, because um, I believe in preservation and advancement through my work and what I do, the platform that I hold. Preservation is extremely important to our culture, being we are 7,000 years old. Our calendar is almost 7,000 years old. We are ancient. To preserve our way of life, our traditions, our language, and genocide is one very important part of it, but it's not all of it. We want to remember what has happened, but we also want to build future leaders. We want to advance, and as Kathy said, in the West, given the opportunities that we have, but never to forget and never again, as you said earlier in our conversation, what other types of uh, signs of genocide is part of the teaching in this uh, Genocide Awareness Week? Uh, we know what has happened with the Holocaust. We know what has happened with other um, genocides that we read in the textbooks. And when do we look forward to hearing more about or reading about what are the signs of genocide in a country or a community or what's happening in China right now? One of the best, uh, there's a um, particular steps. There's there's 10 steps of genocide that, that some people think there are more of that or there are fewer than, than those, but, um, but there are, in general, you can say there are 10 steps to, to genocide. Um, and what you do is you look at those particular steps um, and they're easy to find. You can Google it and, and find the 10 steps of genocide very easily. Um, but you, you can look at that and you can see, well, what, what, what happens? First of all, people are talking der uh, derogatorily about other people and such. And then it becomes codified. It becomes in the law. Uh, where people lose their rights and such. And then eventually the ultimate one is where uh, people are are being murdered for that. Um, so those those sorts of steps all lead to that. And we can see that happening in different places. Uh, you, you could see it, you could, you could easily see it with what happened in Rwanda. Uh, you could see the same thing in Bosnia and um, uh, in the past and today. Uh, and then you could um, you can see it with what was happening with when the Buddhists were killing uh, the Rohingya, the Muslims in um, in, the, in Myanmar, uh, uh, the former Burma. So those things need to be studied so that people can be aware of the inhumanity and the way that the 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 snowball starts rolling and getting bigger and leading ultimately towards this genocide. And you're right, there are different types of genocides. You know, Saddam Hussein, you know, in, uh, in Iraq, he did a um, type of uh, ecocide where he drained the, the swamps for the Marsh Arabs because they didn't support him politically. So he went in and drained those swamps, which was an ecological disaster. Um, after that, they, they are slowly being rebuilt, as it were, so that people can go back and have their, their livelihood and their, their cultural aspect. But that was only, what, 25, 30 years ago when he was doing that. And that's, so that's an ecocide, which was specifically done to destroy the culture of these people. Um, and all because of political reasons. So mm -hmm. this is what we need to make students aware of. And, and adults too, because you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, nowadays people just look at their telephones for their news, and they don't read and get any grasp of the deeper things that are going on. And so, um, yeah, that was one of the things I used to require of my students when uh, when uh, when they were doing research papers. I would give them the lecture, and they, they were not going to be taking notes on their computer or on their phone or so they had to do it by hand because they would hear it 
they would see what my what I put up on the board and such, and then they would write it. So they got it three different ways, and that's a way of internalizing it and remembering it. Um, I love what what Romina is going to be doing out at ASU West. I think that's important that you show uh, exhibits as well as uh, have mm -hmm. have some explanation of those and have photographs and and such because that af affirms the culture that's being shown. You know those the 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 dress that people that your grandparents wore the the any musical instruments or photographs or other artifacts and such affirm mm -hmm. that culture um, that is so old and needs to be preserved because it's important. Um, so to affirm that is doing just what the Turks didn't don't want or didn't want. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the Assyrians to to exist to be on that. They they were happy to to see them die, and so to bring that out and to show, hey, this we have survived. We are living. We are successful. There's an Armenian gentleman. I can't recall his name. Um, I have his book at at work, and he did something because I, I think this is true. You get people who, in certain certain groups who get a, a fatigue of genocide. You, and I've heard heard it from different groups, from, from Jewish community, from uh, Bosnians, from Rwandans, from, and they say, you know, that's not all my life. It's not all my culture is the genocide. That's a part of it. It's a defining part, but it doesn't mean that's all of me. So when we talk about Judaism, there's more to Judaism than that short time that that Nazi Germany was murdering Jews. There's a lot more to it, religiously speaking, culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman went out and he decided to write, what did the Armenians do? What if we had all been annihilated? So what would have, what would have not happened? And it's a really peculiar book, but I think it's great because it shows that, um, I don't know if you know this, but it and it was an Armenian who invented air conditioning for cars. <laughs> Those of us in Arizona, we're really happy about that. And so there are little things like that that prove that Armenians have gone beyond their their genocide to be successful. And and I can see that with the Assyrians. Look at the Assyrians in, in politics and in professional lives. Um, and that itself is important. So it's important to know about the genocide, but it's important to say, we are defeated, we are gonna go ahead and we're going to be successful, which look at look at you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I love what you said, defining moment. And, uh, you know, in conclusion, what Kathy said about memory, about, uh, you know, tackling denial, and uh, resiliency. Resiliency is my favorite word because, yes, we do talk about genocide. We do want to make sure that is not it is not forgotten. But we also want to create future leaders. We want to make sure that other incidents of the Assyrian genocide atrocities in 1933, for example, with you know, the Semela massacre, the massacres that happened in Urmia and different uh, Salamas and, you know, all these other ones. However, when there is cross community and cross um, nation collaboration, I think it, it, it amplifies the attention and the affirmation. And this is why this work is so important. Thank you to all of you for what you're doing. In conclusion, I would like to ask one of you, to uh, inform our viewers, if someone watching this program wants more information or wants to uh, register or to attend, who would they contact? And I'm, I'm sure we will um, display all the information on the flyer, but is there a registration required? Can people actually participate virtually? The way COVID is going, we don't know what's going to happen, but um, I just would like to promote the attendance of this very important event coming up in April. Well, from an ASU point of view, we will have a landing page. There is no registration for any of the events, all of the events, every single one 
is completely free and open to the public. <coughs> um, saying that, we will have extra security on because uh, in today's today's world, we need to have that security there. But there's, you know, in 10 years, we've never had an incident, not one. So I'm not anticipating any happening at ASU either. Um, so it is free. You can Google Genocide Awareness Week. Probably what a lot of what will come up re, uh, will be prior ones that have happened. But you look for GAW, uh, Genocide Awareness Week number 10. And um, that the landing page is forthcoming. <coughs> <clears throat> need a, a couple of more tweaks to it and it'll be out uh i would say uh this month sometime as well as posters and other information and marketing material <coughs> excuse me In conclusion, uh, Kathy, would you like to uh, wrap this up and then we'll hear from Romina and we can have a conclusion on this very important and beautiful interview. Thank you, Romina. Two points to, to close on and they go back to the topic of why are we even doing this? Why are we asking young people to learn about this? Certainly, uh, descendants of genocide survivors. Yes, yeah, sure, there are other things in our lives. I was a lawyer for 40 years. We all had other aspects of our lives. But I want to make the point to our younger people that it isn't so much that we should have some sort of um, blind reverence to all of this, but rather to stop and think about what every single person went through to get through what they did so you could be here doing what you're doing. And I say this to the younger people, sure, you have your careers. We want you to go out and be successful in so many fields, at like at Carmen in journalism or politics, law, academia, science, do these things. But we have to live ourselves, our own lives in a way that bring res brings respect mm -hmm. to the family members that went through what they did so that we got here at some point. And that's what has driven me. That's what I teach my daughter. Oh, and by the way, my daughter, I have to share this vignette with the professor. Uh, my husband's Israeli, and my mother-in-law is a Holocaust survivor. And she <laughs> lost people in Theresienstadt. So our family knows genocide, OK? <laughs> but what I teach my daughter is, and she's a history professor now, in fact, but what I taught her all along was to live in such a way that we bring respect to those people who suffered so badly, the many people who did not make it out, as you know, the hundreds of thousands of Syrians that didn't. We should honor them by doing the best in our lives. And if we're in, in a country in the West, by and large, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And sure, it's a lecture, but I can guarantee you that you are going to be glad you took the time to learn about these things as young people and draw on us older people for information. We're happy to tell the stories that have been passed down to us, our experiences, places that we have gone and traveled in the world, things that our parents, grandparents gave to us. We are always there as a resource. And we that's what I want the younger people to know, especially in our community. Thank you, Kathy. Romina, in closing, what words would you like to leave our viewers with? Uh, uh, Carmen, thank you so much again. Um, I want to just say that uh, this has been a great, um, uh, great interview for me. Thank you for this opportunity. If anybody wants to find out about the work that we do at Safeway Center, 
uh, they can reach us at resolution at safewithcenteraz.com or info at safewithcenter.com. Um, like John said, all of our programs are open to the public. They're free. The photo exhibit at Fletcher Library um, will be uh, open to the public probably during the library hours, um, uh, hopefully during the entire month of April. And I just can't wait for Kathy's exhibit. And I call it Kathy's exhibit, even though it's at CSU uh, Stanislaus and in, uh, Interlock. I can't wait for that exhibit to, uh, to be um, launched and then eventually moved to Arizona. Um, as you know, Carmen, uh, uh, you guys in California tend to be a little bit ahead of us. So whatever happens in California needs to happen in Arizona as well. Uh, so I'm really excited about this. Um, and also to the staff at AGN I, and you, Carmen, I want to remind you that um, April 1st is Assyrian New Year's. Um, we're going to have um, in collaboration with, uh, especially with leadership of um, Assyrian cultural organization, there's going to be a big program for, for Chabnisan. Um, so you can come, your team can come and spend the whole month in Arizona and cover the New Year's. Um, all the activities related to that, and also the Genocide Awareness Week, and also the photo exhibit at the uh, West Campus. So we'll just keep you all here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Romina. Kudos to you, to all your efforts. Uh, this is truly what advocacy and activism for our community is meant to be. Uh, in closing, I would like to thank all of you, Professor John Lifferton. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your research and your thoughts with us. And of course, Kathy and Ramina. This concludes my conversation on the Assyrian um, Genocide Remembrance and the, of course, Genocide Awareness Week in Arizona 2022. Join me on the next Modern Assyrian. This is Carmen Morad on AGM.